this square over here and this square over here are one kilometer apart but they are directly connected with one single street. This street creates optimal conditions for friendly gentrification? If we directly ask you, hey, what is gentrification? Probably you'll be a little bit confused because you know what it is, but you don't know how to put it in a simple sentence. Well, same here. But if we have to dig through books and find one definition that describes gentrification, we would say that gentrification is development of socially vulnerable urban space that goes in the favor of the rich ones at the expense of the low-income families. And these kind of processes are most likely followed by some intensive construction sites of some fancy architecture with limited access and exclusive function. But did you know that gentrification can also occur in a rather hidden, silent and quiet way? You are watching Stripping Architecture and today we'll strip the architecture and reveal an urban phenomena that we have named as subtle gentrification. With the purpose of explaining this process in the most deductive way where you, yourself, can put the inspector's head on and reveal this process on your own, we'll start with brief contextual descriptions of these two squares that are framing this street that has potential for subtle gentrification. Why? Because we strongly believe that if we give broader understanding of the urban context, we will avoid comments such as uh, gentrification is cool and has to happen somewhere. Well, let's get started. This over here is Flaget, and it's actually more than just a square. It is a broader urban environment. This place is very locally popular, and to just briefly show you how contentful it is, we will give you the major markers of it. As you can see here, we have little lakes, which are actually a natural water accumulation systems that are home to diverse and bioclimatic flora and fauna. Around these lakes, we can see a diverse architecture with predominantly neoclassicist style. Along these lakes, you can find a beautiful monastery with relaxing green and urban public spaces. And this whole zone over here has a lot of schools and kindergartens. Over here, you can see this vertical orientational marker, which is actually the bell tower from this stoic church. Right next to this church, we can see this renowned building from the Art Deco era, which is actually now operating as a cultural center and it also hosts a popular architectural school named after the most famous Belgian architect Victor Horta. And there where you have universities, you have a lot of students who are hustling and bustling and looking for places to socialize, to grab a beer, to collaborate. And in other words, there are a lot of bars over here. So on this square also, it's very important that you can find two eminent symbols of the Belgian culture. There is a fry stand over here with a very tasty, delicious fries. And right across from it, you can see a comic, popular comic book store. You can also say that this square is fairly flexible depending on different seasons of the year or different periods and days of the week, it has different functions. For example, during the summer, there is a lot of water fountains over here and children are running around. There is skateboarding happening over here. In the winter time, you can find some quasi Christmas market. In the weekend, you can find here very good food trucks market, a fruit and vegetable market with seafood as well. There is a popular circus that comes and visit this place so you can see a lot of activities and dynamics. And right now, there is an engagement, there is a plan for redeveloping this area where they're planting more trees and making it even more and more attractive and flexible. To briefly tell you how demographically diverse this space is, we can tell you that down that street you can find traces of Portuguese and Polish communities. Up that street, there is actually very Arab-speaking communities. And if you follow that street all the way up to the hill, you will eventually hit neighborhoods with communities from Central and Western Africa. In the last 10 to 15 years, there is actually a lot of migration from France where French people are moving here and finding their more affordable home in Brussels. And not to forget, up that street over there, you will find many restaurants with delicious Asian cuisine. And if you go all the way up, you will find one of the most fanciest commercial streets of Brussels, Avenue Louise or Louise Alain. So you can obviously see that this place is very dynamic, vibrant and full with energy. 
we must say it's not the most architecturally or visually appealing, but definitely it is attractive. In all honesty, one portion of this area is already with elevated real estate price, but the rest of the environment is under pressure of elevated real estate price, but the local communities are trying to hold up to their businesses, homes, to stabilize the market and stay here, because on the end of the day, they're part of the gem that makes this space so interesting, and also they have right to live next to quality urban spaces such as this one. So we can say that the social profile of this whole place is that definitely there is a fraction with people with stable income, but the rest of it is people with diverse life situations. But now, if we just take this street over here and we walk one kilometer away from here, we'll get to this square over here. As you can see, this is a decent square, but definitely we cannot talk that much as we talked about the previous one. I mean, here we have this also a fright stand, there is a lot of bars, and we have to say there are nice parks in proximity. But the major characteristic of this spot over here is that the most of the people who are circulating around here are mostly tourists or people who are working in the European institutions, experts who are working in the European institutions, or people who are working in diplomacy and embassies. And in that sense, most of these bars and restaurants that we see here are operating as a social motor for this particular group of people who are trying to engage with their social life. So the social profile of these people over here is mostly high income, if not stable and steady income people. People from the European Union citizens who mostly don't have problems with documents or buying and acquiring apartments. So we can see that this space over here is also diverse, but if we put it into perspective of the previous square, it's definitely very monolithic. But that's fine, one city should have different kind of urban spaces with different characteristics. So we can obviously see that these two squares are quite different. And now you'll say, yeah, but where is the gentrification here? Before we answer this, we want to ask you one simple question. Can you find similarities between these two different squares? If you think about the open space and the bars, well, that's a global phenomenon. And if you're thinking about the fry stand, that's a Belgian thing. What these two squares actually share in common is topographical similarities. In other words, they're both located on the same above sea level altitude. And comparing the rest of the environment, they're located on the lowest point of the terrain. In other words, they're resting in a hole and they're connected with one level street, which is quite hidden. So whenever you have hidden urban element, there is always potential for manipulation. And now we're slowly walking down this little street that connects the both squares that we have talking about. As you can see, unlike from the squares, the street is starting to get a little bit more narrower and narrower, and you get the feeling that you're walking in a tunnel or you're like sitting in a pit. The natural sunlight and ventilation are not the best parameters over here, and to be honest, there is quite limited public transport. I think there is only one bus line running through here. And as we spoke before, if you want to reach the rest of the environment, most likely you'll be having to walk uphill or climb some stairs. So all of these conditions are making this urban space not to be very desirable. But at the same time, it causes it to have a low real estate value, which is great for low-income families who would like to come in here and live next to quality urban spaces such as the squares that we have just announced. But who else, other than the low-income families, loves low real estate value? Developers. Yes, with the current trends of urban densification, for developers, these kind of spaces with low real estate value next to quality urban spaces is a green turf. But what else do developers love despite low real estate value? Quick return of investments. In other words, quick profits. So if you're a developer, the best way to guarantee your investments is to find these kind of places with low real estate value that are next to people with stable income. And this is how we will remind you to the previous three minutes of our video. If on this side we have people with stable income, people who can have easy liquidity in the banks and easily get loans and no troubles of acquiring apartments, and on that side we have a diverse social groups. 
and you're an investor. On which side of this street you will put your investments? That one, right? And that is what is happening. This place, you can see a lot of new residential buildings. There is expansion and extension of the existing ones and renovating the old buildings. There is attraction of big grocery shops. We can also see remodeling of the urban landscaping and so on. We have new school with quite eminent aesthetics and all of the things that are actually not aggressive. They are not restaurants or exclusive offices. These places are actually kind, right? So these developers are not doing anything bad, right? They are enhancing, improving and making all this area a bit more beautiful. But now, one last question. Even if these places are, let's say, inclusive and they are affordable for different groups, what do you think? What social group of people will be the first one to occupy them and acquire them? The one with the stable income or the one with unpredictable future? You're kind of guessing the answer, right? And this, our friends, is what we call subtle gentrification. The bigger danger over here is that with this trend of little small urban improvements can slowly start expanding throughout all the streets creating more and more better spaces and slowly elevating the real estate value and eventually kicking out all that diversity we have seen in the beginning of this video. And now probably you'll say like, ah oh, yeah, douchebags, big f deal, you located a problem, give us a solution. Well, that's part of the issue, that these kind of problems are hard to being addressed. And that's why when you cannot address something, actually there is no problem. It's very important that we make these things a bit more visible. Second thing is that we all know this, knowledge is power. Most of the people here, the regular citizens of this city, of these areas over here, are not quite aware what is actually going on. And that's why we find it a bit more a bigger responsibility of the authorities and the municipalities to educate these people of what are the future plans of these developments. Because let's be honest, they know about this, they're making mappings, they're making statistics, they can see the maps on top of it from a top-down approach and they know what exactly is going on over here. And at least what we can do is to kind of empower these people for the future plans of these areas. Third thing, we understand that regular citizens, for them who are working all the time and busy with their children, it's kind of hard to stay up to date with all the different um, developments and to stay engaged with their neighborhoods and that's why we have to create certain kind of associations or people that can advocate for them and to kind of limit these developments to set the standards to see what can be done and it can be beneficial or advantageable for all the different groups as a matter of fact right over here we have an organization that works with participation and urban design through participation and co-creation but not many of these developers are finding a suitable time or place to ask them and to invite them to together try to create the space. Why? Because yes, we all love profits, but some people like quick profits. And consulting different kind of groups maybe doesn't deliver us quick profits, but definitely it gives us sustainable solutions on the long term. As always, we're gonna quickly wrap up this video with one of our sketch reflections. As you can see on the sketch on your right side, we've made this little illustration to make this urban phenomena a little bit more comprehensible for you and for everyone. Therefore, we have imagined one place that is not very desirable for living because simply is inaccessible. But there is a developer who decided to build over there and make this place a little bit more interesting. And the developer also has made affordable building. But let's presume that on one side of the sketch there is one neighborhood that is populated with high-income people and on the other side we have low-income families. If you take a closer look, you'll see that there are bridges that are access to the new development. But you can also see that the bridges that are towards the neighborhood with high-income people are a little bit wider, they're more stable and they're nicely done. On the other hand, we can see that the bridges who are towards the neighborhoods with low-income families are a little bit twisted, little pathways, shaky and unstable. With these bridges, actually, we want to make personification of the different software and hardware that is given to different social groups with the respect of acquiring a property. In other words, even if we create affordable and inclusive developments, if one social group 
that happens to be the privileged one more quickly and promptly occupies and captures these places and do not kick out low-income families in this process, that's still a gentrification. Thank you very much for staying tuned with us. Hopefully you learned something else and we see you in the next episode in the next week. Bye-bye.